With the number of smartphones and tablets that are sold every year, companies are having to come up with ways to reach their audience where they are. Not only through social media and places like that, but also people that are going to be looking for content on those phones and tablets. And one of the ways they're doing that is through podcasting. There is no doubt by producing a podcast, you can reach an audience that you might have otherwise never reached. You just have to figure out a way to make a podcast work for your business that not only puts you in a position where people can find you and learn about your expertise, but also think, wow, if their content is this good and I get this for free, I wonder how good their products and services are that I would pay for. So what you're about to hear is a sample podcast that I did for trainup.com. I wanted them to hear what a podcast for their business might actually sound like. They're kind of like the Expedia of the training industry. They have trainers all over the country that specialize in training for just anything and everything. It can be IT, it can be human resources, leadership management. So they were definitely primed to put themselves in a position to be a thought leader in not only the training industry, but also showcase their expertise in all those areas simply by bringing their trainers on to talk about important topics. But before I got started, I asked, what is a training topic that people ask for all the time, all over the country? And they told me sexual harassment. So I pulled in one of their sexual harassment trainers and interviewed him in a format that would be perfect for a podcast, and I put some production value around it too so it would sound like a podcast. And the idea is to be talking about important topics that are relevant to their target audience so when they listen, they not only get informative content, but they start to wonder, who is this company, and how do I find out more about them? That is the power of a podcast. TrainUp.com presents... The Training Insights Podcast, an in-depth discussion about the world of professional and personal development. And now, here's your host, Scott Murray. Hello, everyone, and thanks for tuning in to the very first edition of the Training Insights Podcast. We've um, started this podcast to be just one more learning and knowledge sharing resource for businesses and organizations, as well as individuals. We're going to discuss a number of topics relating to human resources, leadership, workplace trends, social learning, and so much more. Part of that discussion is going to involve interviews, and there's a really good reason why the topic of today's show is starting the conversations we are going to have with you. And it all stems from the fact that here at TrainUp, we get calls all of the time about sexual harassment training. And when we get those calls, we hear a lot of the same things from people about how hard it is to find that kind of training, also how hard it is to find training materials that are current and, for all intents and purposes, practical. And if you're in an organization that doesn't necessarily need to train all employees or even an entire department, maybe you just need it for one person, um, that can be a real challenge to find. So what do you do? Well, in a moment, we're going to talk to Peter O'Neill, who is a sexual harassment trainer. In fact, he's one of the trainers that we connect people to when they're looking for sexual harassment training. And we're going to get some insight about this and find out the ways that he conducts a seminar. We're also going to find out about how the training is different for employees and supervisors. And the hope is you'll have a better understanding of the training materials you might need if you're in a position where you need that kind of training. So, despite how hard it is to find a trainer on this topic, You'll now know an experienced one, and I'm going to take care of the interview process for you. Before we get to that interview, we're going to hit a segment that we simply call the chalkboard, where we're going to learn some quick words of wisdom from the business and development world. So, let's take a look at the board. First, in the world of HR, John Holland wrote a really interesting piece on TNLT.com about what benefits employees really value the most. It all stems from a survey released by Mercer, a global HR consultant, and it covered workers in 10 key markets all over the world, and to sum it up, the results basically showed that employees prefer benefits that provide instant gratification instead of the ones that grow in value over time. 
In the US, things like salary increases and additional time off ranked at the top of the list, whereas things like gym memberships and on-site health clinics ranked towards the bottom. That's just what we need, right? More bad publicity about our health habits. Well, you can find out more and get a link to the Mercer survey on tlnt.com. In the world of leadership. Nothing like visiting the happy people at your local Department of Safety to remind you about the importance of keeping your employees inspired. That's what happened to Michael Hyatt recently. After interacting with what he called a lifeless staff, it reminded him of what can happen when employees get disconnected from their purpose. So he recently shared four ways to keep inspiration alive in your organization. Number one, connect people to the larger story. Number two, remind people why they matter. Number three, resist creating new policies. And number four, set the pace for what you expect in others. You can get a much more in-depth look at those at michaelhyatt.com. And that's H-Y-A-T-T. Finally, in the world of job searching. Anyone that's ever interviewed with Google knows full well that it can feel like a journey through Middle Earth. So, needless to say, you have to be prepared. So Miriam Salpeter of U.S. News & World Report shared some tips on how to succeed in the marathon interview. Some of her advice includes ask questions in advance, be well rested, prepare stories and examples to describe your success, be mindful of your body language, practice your active listening skills, and be sure to keep your answers precise and to the point. And I would say these are probably beneficial in these shorter interviews as well. You can find Miriam on usnews.com, but we also have links to all three of these articles on the show notes at trainup.com's Training Insights blog. Up next, we're talking to Peter O'Neill about providing effective sexual harassment training for both employees and supervisors in today's workplace. Peter O'Neill has been involved in employee and HR training his whole career. His background includes serving as the Human Resources Director at Mobile Oil for over 20 years. He's been a coach to senior executives at companies like Chevron Mining, Exxon Mobil, Mary Kay, AmeriCredit, and WFS Financial. His extensive background has allowed him to impact the success of employees and senior executives in a number of industries, and he could cover a variety of HR and workplace-related topics for us today, but we're going to focus on one very important topic and that is sexual harassment in the workplace. We're going to talk about what makes a comprehensive training session on this and how the landscape of harassment in the workplace has changed and why it's important for companies to offer training for their employees. Peter, welcome to the Training Insights Podcast. Thank you for having me. How long have you been conducting this sort of training? I've really been doing this kind of training my whole career, having uh, spent all of my career in human resources. So this is a piece of human resources. I've done investigations as well as training along the area of sexual harassment. So it really covers a lot of ground for me. How long do these training sessions generally last? They're generally two to three hours, um, and I do them both for uh, employees only and supervisors only because there are different pieces that I provide to the different uh, audiences. So uh, I try to vary it based on the need. And are you doing this all over the United States or beyond? Well, I, I do it uh, more virtually, but can go anywhere to do it uh, around the country since obviously the laws are the same on a, on a broad basis. And uh, so anywhere um, a company needs this kind of training. Uh, I did one in San Antonio a couple of weeks ago and did an individual one-on-one -on -one based on an individual who needed that kind of training in particular, uh, according to the company. So it really depends. I can do, like, say, virtual. Uh, I can do group, one-on-one. -on -one, just depends on the need. One of the reasons why we wanted to have this conversation today is because it seems that sexual harassment training is really hard to find. We get lots of calls from people who are having trouble finding it. They come to train up so that we can track it down for them. But you would think that this would be training that would be easy to find. Why is sexual harassment training so tough to find and hard to find with really good practical materials? I think there's several factors around that. One would be the training budget. You look at the training budget and today where uh, dollars for any business are tight, companies really look at 
where can we use our dollars the most effective, whether it's on technology, uh, our product development, uh, different aspects of the business, but in specific to training. When they look at training, they think of employee training for their skills to help the company at this moment right now and get the product out the door to the customers. So when you look at what we call soft skills training, like sexual harassment, it's not something that hits a headline unless it hits a headline. And it's a big or becomes a problem at the company. And there's an incident. And they say, wow, we need to have training. Then finding the training, because it isn't something that trainers really teach that much. It's an area that's uh, an offshoot and, and, and kind of an orphan on its own. But when it's needed, it's very, very important. And it really should be more prevalent. So it's basically a supply and demand issue? It really is supply and demand. And I've done a number of those where on one day I'll do training with an individual who had a, quote, incident. And the next day I do the training for the employee population, usually one with employees only and then with supervisors, two separate ones, because of the nature of the training for the two different groups, whereby supervisors obviously has more supervisory relationship to it. But then also emphasizing the company policy. So I get a number of those calls to do that kind of training. So as I said in the introduction, you've been doing this from your whole career. As it relates to sexual harassment training, how would you say as far as what you have to teach has changed maybe in the last five or ten years on this topic? I think the changes um, stem from what society believes is okay um, in terms of uh, our mores and what people say and how people act and react to each other, which when translated, when you look at uh, cable TV, for example, and what's on TV these days, if it translates into the business, it can be a real problem. And that's where you look at generational aspects of different age groups who look at these kind of things in different ways and accept certain things and don't accept others, which is a big piece of how it's changed and how the education is even more and more important for all levels of individuals as well as all age groups around this very important topic, I think. Well, considering how interpretations of things or even influences in our culture can change so fast, is it safe to say that interpretations of things, even in the sexual harassment realm, are always changing? I think so, absolutely, because as case law changes for any uh, area in business, uh, to include sexual harassment, for example, companies have to stay up with uh, what is happening, what are the latest rules, so to speak, what's being interpreted by the courts as opposed to what's been already legislated. So the court system changes what the rules are just based on the court cases. So the training has to keep up with that as well. So retraining employees really on an annual basis to include new employees who have come in. So you really get both. You get what are the latest rules, so to speak, based on court findings, court rulings, as well as new employees being trained in the company policy and what what's okay and what's not okay in regard to what involves sexual harassment. So having that education on on a frequent basis is very important for all companies to do. You know, I'm finding that, especially in recent years, that the whole generational aspect of training and getting to know the workplace a little bit better and understanding the differences in the way Generation X, Generation Y not only interprets things but behaves or communicates in the workplace. I would assume this is a big part of your training. Yes, absolutely. Because when you look at society today and the multiple generations that we have due to longevity of our lifespans now, you have the younger group, 18, 20, 25, 30. You have the baby boomers who are still working and very active in the workforce and everybody in between from a generational standpoint. And there are many different mores. So what a 22-year-old thinks is okay to do, a baby boomer would be disgusted by that and it would potentially be illegal where the the you know middle the 20s person goes I don't understand that I can do that on the outside I can do that in the real world but it in work at business it's not okay and so those are the changes that happen so the education is very very important say so, well I didn't mean anything by that I didn't mean that but it does mean it to the receiver because it is in the eye of the beholder that is a big piece of the training to understand there are certain kinds of things that constitute sexual harassment that most people would agree are pretty obvious. What are some of the things that people are learning in these courses that on the surface may not be as obvious? 
One example that I like to use is a new young female employee being hired into a position that's fairly visible with a company, whether it's a receptionist, a secretary for a group, and young men will tend to go hang around that person where they have no business there, and they don't think it's a big deal, and well, it's a, it's a new female, a new young female, it's kind of fun, but it's, it's very pressure-filled for that person because that person's in their work area. They can't go anywhere. They, they're a new employee. They don't know if they should complain. They don't know if it's seen as a problem, but they feel the pressure of it and don't like it, but don't know who to tell about it. So using that kind of example where the young men would go, well, that's not a big deal. I didn't mean anything by it. See, that's one of those examples whereby it is a big deal to that person. So it, you have to respect that person's space and their feelings and not do that kind of thing. So I use a lot of examples that are kind of subtle that don't seem like a big deal, like telling an off-color joke. And it, it is a big deal, and it has no place in the workplace. And I use a zero-tolerance policy. And that's what it has to be. You know, that's a really interesting point because essentially what we're talking about here is a uh, branch of sexual harassment that isn't what we usually think of, yet it does involve both sexes. And in this case, the harassment involves this girl in this position who's having a lot of attention drawn away from her work for what, as you say, are pretty obvious reasons. Right. And, and she also may feel pressure from that because she knows why they're there and she's very uncomfortable and doesn't know what to do about it. Out on the street, so to speak, it would be fine. And the answer is yes, it might be because she would have an avenue to exit and get away from it at work. She doesn't. So it's a much different proposition. And the company is responsible for making sure that they have a safe, comfortable work environment. And that kind of thing does not happen and is not allowed. How much of a broad scope does your training cover when it comes to who's the victim and who's the perpetrator? Like generally we think of the male harassing the female, but it can go the other way around. Not in most cases, but it does happen. How do you balance that when it comes to training? In my training, everything is about sexual harassment of anybody on anybody. It's, it's, it's not unique to male, female. As you said, a majority is because that's the way our society is, but it's also same sex. There's no doubt about it, and I make it very, very clear in my training and all company policies that I've seen have that component in it to make it very, very clear that that type of activity is not allowed on anybody's part. It's just it's sexual harassment, regardless of of who the people are, what their sexual orientation is, doesn't matter. So everybody is protected and should be. Now, I know we don't have time for you to basically conduct a whole session here, but um, you outline for employees six important things that they need to know about sexual harassment. Can you just touch on a couple of the most important ones, just to give people a sense of what you cover? One uh, is to know the company policy. The company policy is what drives the thinking of individuals within the company, and they need to understand that. They also need to understand what is the, quote, complaint procedure. So if they think they've seen an instance or experienced an incident of sexual harassment, who do they go to? How do they report it? What are the possible ramifications? And are they comfortable in reporting it in a confidential way that will be held confidential for them? And it's very important for the company to recognize that and the employees to recognize it and feel comfortable to do that. So emphasizing that in the training is one thing I always do is to get the company policy and reiterate that with the employees as well as all the legalities and real good examples of what is and isn't sexual harassment so it's practical. Okay, so this is the training for employees. How does everything change when you're providing the training for supervisors? With supervisors, I like to emphasize that not taking action when it's actually appropriate to is really saying it's okay to act that way. So a supervisor walking down a hallway and hearing an off-color joke being told in an office by a cubicle to another employee, especially a male to a female, and not stopping and either stopping it or going to the supervisor of the person telling the joke and getting some action taken and some re-education in that regard is not appropriate because that person seeing the supervisor walk by would say, I guess it's okay to do this because they didn't say anything. So not saying something is admission that it's fine. You can go ahead and do that. 
and it's not okay. So supervisors have to have both the permission and level of responsibility to take action, even though it may not be totally comfortable to do that. That is their role, is to protect and take care of the employees as well as make sure the work gets done. Now, we're talking bigger scopes here about getting maybe a company trained or a department trained, but you also provide one-on-one training when that's needed. Yes, I will do one-on-one training. I have done one-on-one training, and it's to some degree the same training, but obviously very concentrated, and I make sure the individual really understands the examples and what is involved, as well as the penalties possibly for the company and that person, as well as the impact on the individual. And it is a big deal. And so they need to understand that. So I've done that uh, a number of times. So these days in this climate, in this work environment, if a company does not take the steps to train their employees on this subject, what are the risks that they're taking? There's a term that's called hostile environment. And what a hostile environment is from a sexual harassment standpoint is an environment, a workplace where the culture accepts things like The hovering around a female employee, the off-color jokes, the comments here and there, oh, that's woman's work, I don't need to do that, you need to do that, I don't clean up, that's woman's work, those kinds of comments that are all sexually related, if taken each on their own, may not be constituted as an incident of major sexual harassment, but when put together in like a class action suit, can be huge. And that is not something a company wants to be involved in or have or be declared against them. And the company can also be held liable if the court finds they should have known this type of activity was happening, but didn't do anything about it, didn't know, weren't aware through their supervision. And that's where the training comes in to understand what that means. And to your point, what are the possible penalties, concerns around those kind of things? So a company could get charged and actually be rendered a, a huge fine, like a $25, $30 million fine, not knowing that they had a problem. And I would assume that if there is a court case like that, especially something that might make news, that not only do you have an internal problem, but depending on how it gets out there, something like that could also destroy a company's reputation, I would think. Oh, yes. There was a bank uh, who recently, it's an international bank, huge bank, that uh, had a uh, settlement recently of $25 million for one woman who was found to have been egregiously sexually harassed. And part of the uh, agreement that the company wanted to have was to not have their name divulged as part of the settlement, and she refused. She wanted the company's name to be divulged really to help other females in the company, in that bank, should there be other issues in other locations versus the one she was in. So it did get published. To your point, as we know, in business, publicity is huge. And I, I don't care what ad people say, negative publicity is not always a good deal and, and, and a good thing and free. It's free, but it's not a good deal. So that's the kind of thing that can happen to a company. As you said, with the media we have these days, it can spread like wildfire and be a real problem. And just for hiring practices, trying to hire good people to that company, recruiting at colleges, those kinds of things. They could be banned from colleges to do recruiting on campus yeah. just for that kind of publicity and go, no, no, we're not going to do that. And it's it's one incident, but it's viewed to be huge. And it's just very, very negative to the company. Well, as we wrap things up today, what are some other advantages or what's a closing thought as to the reasons why it's good for an organization to provide sexual harassment training? I would say it does not appear normally to be a real high priority until there's an incident or until there's a big problem that suddenly shows up on their desk uh, or in the media, perhaps, because it doesn't have to be reported inside the company. Uh, A person can go externally to the EEOC and get it reported. Then it comes back to the company. So having it a priority in terms of the the training and, uh, for example, annual training should be on every company's agenda as just a preventive measure to do to be on the safe side and make sure everything's running well within the company in that regard. Because it seems like a minor thing until it becomes a major thing. So having the prevention is well worth it. Well, Peter O'Neill, thank you so much for being here. It's been a very interesting and informative discussion on a very important topic. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your knowledge with us. 
Thank you for having me. I uh, enjoyed it very much. That's going to wrap things up for this edition of the Training Insights Podcast. If you have a story or blog that you'd like to submit for consideration on the show, please send it to me at smurray, M-U-R-R-A-Y, at trainup.com. I'm also going to be reaching out to all of you on Twitter regarding upcoming guests and take some questions for you to ask them. You can follow me at trainupscott. You can also follow trainup at trainuptweets and on facebook.com forward slash trainup and even on Pinterest which is pinterest.com forward slash train up. See a pattern forming there? Thank you all for tuning in today. I hope you found the show to be informative, and I'm looking forward to continuing our in-depth discussion about the world and professional and personal development. Thanks for listening. The Training Insights Podcast has been brought to you by trainup.com, the web's largest training marketplace.